Today's reading will be taken from the New International Version from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In these three verses, the author describes Jesus, that he stands above and apart from anyone else. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact rep representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hey, good morning, everyone. And welcome to those of you who are at home that may be watching, and any of you that are visiting, we are glad to have you. This month, Jay and I decided to work together on a sermon series titled, Jesus, the Son of God, and it's a very appropriate, you know, the time of the month. Last week, Brother Jay talked about the grace of God, and the week before that, we read about Jesus. We, we talked about and read about his birth to his death. And many people like to celebrate the birth of Christ during this month. But we should really celebrate his death since that is where the power lies in saving us from our sins. So in this lesson, what we want to explore is another important point when it comes to Jesus, the Son of God. Some people believe that Jesus was just a good man. Some people actually have this view of Jesus. He's just a good man. He was teaching values. He was teaching morals. But Jesus was much more than that, as we're going to see in this lesson. So the text this morning is John chapter 1. We, I have it listed there, 1 to 14, but actually I'm not going to be looking at all, all of those verses. I'm looking at seven of them. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 3 of John chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 14. So let's start off with verses 1 to 3 of the book of John. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so we read about the Word. The Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Well, the original Greek word for word is logos. I actually pronounce it as logos because the two O's are the same in the original Greek. So it should be logos, but we pronounce it as logos for some reason. Well, the Logos is a very huge topic of study, and in no way could I do it justice in just one lesson, and I don't intend to do that. But a lot of people have tried to define this word, Logos. And so, Heraclitus, who was an ancient Greek philosopher, he lived in Ephesus, and it was under Persian rule at the time, between 535 and 475 BC. He viewed the Logos as the principle which controls the universe. So, Think about the Word. As I'm going through this, think about the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word, the Word was viewed as the principle, the principle that defines the universe, that controls the universe. The Logos is what sustains and holds the universe together. That was his view. Stoics saw the Logos as the very soul of the world, the very soul of the world. So think about these two things. The Logos sustains and holds the universe together, the Logos is the very soul of the, of the world. And we know that when we read that in John chapter 1, the Word is referring to Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the one who sustains and holds the universe together. Jesus is the one who is the very soul of the world. To many Jews, the Logos was the manifestation of God. The manifestation of God. According to one source, the Cambridge Dictionary, the word manifestation means a sign of something existing or happening or appearance. So we see the definitions. We don't see the definitions up there. Okay. So the definitions, let me say the definitions again. It says sign of something existing or appearance. Sign of something existing or appearance. So to many Jews, the Logos was the sign of God existing. The sign of God existing or was the appearance of God. Now when we think that the word is Jesus, think about that. 
Jesus was the sign of God existing. Jesus was the appearance of God. Well, there's a lot of more definitions that we could look at for Logos, but these should be enough to help us to understand. Jesus was and is the Logos, the Word of God. He was the obvious sign of God's existence. The Word or Logos was God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. God appeared in the form of man. Take a look, John chapter 1, verse 14. As it describes the Word, it says, The Word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. So think about the things that we said. The principle. The principle that sustains the universe. The word becomes flesh. Makes his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the father. Full of grace and truth. So the word was with God. The word was with God the father. And the word was God. Jesus became flesh. He made his dwelling among us. The Greek word for made his dwelling might interest you. It means to tent or to tabernacle. So in the same way that God tabernacled in the time of the Israelites, he came and he filled the tabernacle. God tabernacles. He puts on flesh. He takes on a body and he tab tabernacles. God is in that body and he is with us. So from the first three verses and this one, John chapter 1 verse 14, we see a few things. First of all, we see that Jesus and the Father are two different persons. Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. Jesus and the Father are two different persons. Some groups teach that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all manifested in Jesus, that Jesus is all three, that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's not true. There's enough scriptural evidence to refute that. Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Son. Secondly, Jesus is equal with God the Father. We learn that from that passage. He was with God the Father in the beginning. He comes down to earth, but he's equal. Take a look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. We'll have those. Yep, we have that up on the screen there. You can follow along. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Listen to the description of Jesus here. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And I'll read, I'll continue verse 7. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being made in human likeness. So Jesus was equal with the Father because he was God the Son. Jesus was just as much deity, just as much as God the Father was. John chapter 5 now, verses 17 to 23. So John chapter 5, verses 17 to 23. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this, is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer: I tell you the truth, the Son could do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So what do we understand from that? Well, the very thing that we've been talking about. We could see in this passage of Scripture that Jesus and the Father were two distinct persons. They were not one and the same. And Jesus was equal with the Father. So we have Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. The all three are equal with one another in an agreement with one another. But we understand from scriptures that Jesus placed himself under the Father and the Holy Spirit placed himself under the Father and the Son to fulfill God's plan. But the three are one God. And that's, sometimes that's a hard thing for us to understand, a hard thing for us to grasp. Well, the third thing we learn from the, the verses that we looked at is Jesus is eternal, which means he lives forever, just as the Father lives forever. 
and he was with the Father before the creation of the world. So Jesus always had a beginning. Or actually, I should say, never had a beginning, just like the Father has never had a beginning. He was always with God the Father. Well, many people think that because Jesus was born to Mary, that he was just a man. Others think that he was a created being or a demigod, which means a half-god. So, so people have different views of, of Jesus and who Jesus was. These are not true because the Bible shows us that it isn't true. Jesus didn't just begin to exist when Mary gave birth to him. He was around even before that. We know that, that John, in the, the book of John, chapter 8, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am, meaning that he existed even before Abraham. And so we understand that. Take a look, if you will, at Colossians chapter 1. And you can see that this lesson is actually turning a little bit into a defense of the deity of Christ. And we're showing scriptures to show the deity of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, in describing Jesus, it says, He is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, notice what it says, this is talking about Jesus. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So we learn that he's the head of the church. We learn that he is deity. He sustains all things. All things were crea created by Jesus. That's a different image than what we get when we think of the, the humanity of Jesus, isn't it? When we think that he's the one that created all things created by him, for him, and sustains all things, yes, we get a different image of Jesus. Jesus was before all things. Jesus always existed, and he's the head of the body, his church. As we read in John chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Jesus was with the Father in the beginning, and through him all things were made. And Jesus has been with the Father from the very beginning, along with the Holy Spirit. If you go back to the very first book of this Bible, the very first book, the very first two verses of this Bible. Listen to what we read. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we learn that God the Spirit was also around at the time that all things were created. But later on in verse 26... Notice, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Notice, let us, plural, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Us, God, plural, God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Godhead. God is in three persons. If Jesus was a created being, then that means he was created when Mary gave birth to him. He shouldn't have a past before that, right? But that's what we're reading. We're reading that Jesus existed before that. Jesus said in John 8, 58, this is what I mentioned, that before Abraham was born, I am. Let me show you something you might not have noticed in your Bibles. If you look at John chapter 8, and I want to show this to you, and I, I've done this lesson at the very beginning when they first arrived here. But I just want to show you this. In John chapter 8, verses 21 to 28, and I want to show you something you might have never seen before. Starting in verse 21, this is what we read. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I've been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, we know that when he's saying that, he's talking about when he's put on the cross. 
When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. So here's something that I want to show you, and, and I want to point out something. You'll notice in the NIV, it has a bracketed section, the one I claim to be, and it's in brackets. But if, if you've taken a look, if you've ever taken a look at the beginning, at the preface, and notice what it says about how they put the Bible together, and this is what it says about the bracketed sections, bracketed sections. To achieve clarity, the translators sometimes supplied words not in the original text but required by the context. If there was uncertainty about such material, it is enclosed in brackets. Notice the bracketed session, the one I claim to be not in the original text. Well, the King James Version, the New American Standard Bible and others add the personal pronoun he, that is not in the original text. So what happens when you take that bracketed section out? It's not in the original text. What do you get? Okay, so we see in verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. You will indeed die in your sins. And then down in verse 28, he says again, So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. That I am. The great I am. That makes you look at that text a little different, doesn't it? I am is what we read about in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. It was what God told Moses to tell the Israelites if they were to ask Moses what God's name was. He says, tell them I am. So we see a different picture of Jesus. We're not looking, we're not thinking of his humanity anymore. We're realizing he's more than just a man. As we read a moment ago, Jesus said he was not of this world. That alone should settle the matter. I mean, when I read that, I'm not of this world. That tells me right there. It's like, okay. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty explanatory, isn't it? We know that Jesus came to die for us. But was that the only reason? Is that the only reason Jesus left his home in glory, took on flesh, left his world, came to our world, put on flesh, and decided to die for us, to die for our sins? Is that the only reason? Well, we know that that's the main reason. But I want to I point out another reason. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Verses 22, 22 to 29, I won't read that section, but God's people back then, the Israelites, were afraid to hear God's thunderous voice and see the fire on the mountain. So they said to Moses, you know what, you talk to God and you tell us what God tells you. Because we, we can't listen to his voice anymore or we're going to die. We're, we're scared. We can't do it. And so, later on in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19, this is what we read. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Verses 15 to 19. And it talks about the great prophet who would come. This is what it says. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So this is Moses talking. He says, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet for you, like me, from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on that day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. So Moses, Moses says, the Lord says, what you said is good. And, and the Lord is going to do what you have asked. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words, that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. So it was prophesied long ago that a great prophet would come later, and he would come from among his own people. He would speak the very words of God. Anyone who would not listen to him would be cut off from among God's people. Well, who was the prophet, and when did he come? Well, in Acts chapter 3, when we flip ahead to the New Testament, we see this fulfilled. In Acts chapter 3. And in that chapter, we see that a, a person was, was healed, a man that was lame. And we see that he was a beggar who used to sit in front of the temple gate called Beautiful. The Jews in the temple were astonished that he was healed. He was healed. And Peter and John had passed by, told him to stand, and he was healed. And so Peter asked them why they were surprised. And then he begins to teach them about Jesus. And first he said, 
that they helped put Jesus to death on the cross. Jesus, Peter tells them, you helped put Jesus to death on the cross. And then he says this, verses 16 to 23. Notice what he says. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has, appoint, has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Notice verse 22 and 23. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. He quotes that passage from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 18. And he's talking about Jesus. He's helping them to understand who Jesus is. They're seeing him as a human being in front of him. And he's trying to tell them, this is God the Son. He's deity. He is the great prophet of Deuteronomy chapter 18. So they not only were to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah and prophet, but they were to listen to him so they wouldn't be cut off from among God's people. So God heard his people. God came up with a way for his people to hear the voice of God. Notice the wisdom of God. He came up with a way for people to hear the voice of God and not be afraid. God came and here he was. He was in the flesh. And people could talk to him. And they could walk with him. And they didn't have to be afraid. Can you imagine? The wisdom of God. They would hear God and they would have no excuse not to listen to him. So when we see and understand God's plan from beginning to the end, the creator dying for his creation, because remember, Jesus created all things, and then he turned around and he died for us. The creator died for his creation. We realize that Jesus was and is more than just a good man. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is the king of creation, and he should be Lord of our lives. And yeah, you probably recognize those two hymns that I just alluded to, right? But do we really understand the words when we're singing those songs? Do we understand how great Jesus is? To accept Jesus as Lord means you must believe that he really was and is God in the flesh. His incarnation is fulfillment of a great many prophecies. You go back to the Old Testament, you read lots of things about the coming of Jesus. If everything we looked at is not enough to convince you that Jesus was God in the flesh, then let's look at one last verse. Let's look at his birth, because that's what we're talking about this month. His birth, we're talking about his death. But look at his birth and see what the Bible says about it. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. We mentioned this two weeks ago, but we'll mention it again today. Starting verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus saves us. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? Which means God with us. So here's Jesus in the flesh as a human walking among them. He's God in the flesh. God with us. The creator in human form. Can you imagine? If anybody then got it, they must have been just absolutely amazed to be in his presence. I would be. The creator, here he is in the flesh, walking, talking to us, teaching us. When Jesus walked among the people, he was and he still is God. He is deity. He wasn't a created being. He wasn't a half God. He was fully God and he was fully man at the same time. And he came so that we could be saved and have a right relationship with God once again. 
We can hear the voice of God and not be afraid, and we can also know the grace of God, that love and mercy that we don't deserve. So the question is, have you come to Jesus? If you haven't, why don't you do that today? Why don't you do that right now and be reunited with God through the waters of baptism? Why don't you do that as we sing our invitation song? Let's stand as we sing our last song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in?